during a time in the Old Testament of great political upheaval and spiritual darkness, uh, a time when uh, God's people rejected him uh, and opted to worship anything and everything other than God, uh, God uh, uh, brought a prophet in view uh, who was a mighty man of God. Uh, he, his name uh, is not ever to be forgotten. His name was Elijah. Uh, and Elijah was a great man of prayer. People uh, feared when he prayed uh, because he prayed with such power uh, and, and the content of what he asked from God came to pass in profound ways. Uh, when you study his life, you study how to live a godly life in a godless day. Uh, you, uh, when you study his life, you learn how God shapes and hones a person uh, that he's going to use. Um, I've spent much time reflecting on him in my lifetime, uh, and he teaches us much. Uh, profound, profound lessons are from the pen of the, of the writer and first kings of his life. But when you look at uh, some of his great exploits as a mighty man of God, uh, the pinnacle of his life definitely was uh, Mount Carmel when he took on the 450 prophets of Baal. Uh, what an amazing day that must have been. One lone prophet of God and Jezebel's 450 prophets of Baal. Uh, this all occurred on Mount Carmel, and I took a picture. I've had many pictures when I take people on archaeology tours. Uh, this is a picture from uh, uh, the northern rim of the Valley of Armageddon uh, from the city of Nazareth. So Jesus would have seen this on a daily basis uh, as he would walk this direction from his house. Uh, as he walked uh, to the various little towns around there to do carpentry work, the, he would have gone on these hills many times. This would have been the same hill, uh, scholars theorized, that they attempted to throw Jesus off the cliffs when he, when he claimed himself to be the Messiah. These are the only cliffs in the area. Um, when you look at this beautiful picture of Armageddon, it's hard to imagine that uh, the history of the world will consummate here. Imagine every day Jesus is looking at this knowing that one day I shall come uh, and reclaim what has been lost in, because of sin. But on this particular uh, valley, over on the other side of it, you can't see it, it's out of view, uh, but over on the western rim of the Valley of Armageddon is Mount Carmel. And that's where the, the feet between uh, the 450 prophets of Baal and Elijah took place. And you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the story. Uh, it's an amazing story how they built their altar and, and begged their God all day long, the gods to send fire and consume their, their altar, and nothing happened. And then when Elijah finally got his turn, uh, he he's pours gallons of water on his sacrifice and it soaks it so it couldn't even catch on fire and uh, fire came down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice of Elijah and he, and he then summarily turned the people back away from Baal worship. Uh, Elijah was a great man. Uh, on my second day when I take people to Israel, this is where we go, is Mount Carmel, to stand in the spot overlooking the Valley of Armageddon to see where this great battle between false gods and the true God took place. But after that great spiritual victory, when you read chapter 19, uh, you, you, your, your jaw drops when you see what happens there. Because after this great victory in his life, God used him in a profound fashion, uh, in chapter 19, he, he gets word that Jezebel, the king's wife, uh, who is not a nice individual, is, is out to kill him because she's, he's cut into her power base. She's going to hunt him down. What's he do? He runs. Of all things, he runs. He runs for his life. He heads due south across the hills of Israel, uh, and he winds up in Beersheba. That's uh, another place we go on our tours to Israel. Uh, he winds up in Beersheba. It's on the outer edge of south Israel in the middle of nowhere. When you go there, you look to infinity, and it's just flat to infinity. He goes there uh, with one of his key servants, and he's not going there to praise God and thank God for helping him. He's running for his life. And while he's there, he heads off by foot uh, in, into the bush to wallow in his self-pity. God, why is this happening to me? Uh, he uh, doesn't uh, stay there. He heads even further south. He starts walking, and he walks all the way to Mount Sinai. Imagine. I've been out there before with archaeology tours. Uh, there's nothing out there. Try to find a tree. It's rocks and stone and sand and, and weird little bugs and things to infinity. He walks to Mount Sinai to get away from Jezebel. Surely she won't find me here. He winds up at Mount Sinai in a cave. He's in the same location where God gave the law to Israel. And he's in a cave of all places thinking she can't find me here. And while he's in that cave, God shows up. Because God's telling him, you've lost hope, man. And God shows up in a profound way. God does three things to get his prophet's attention. First, he comes in that cave uh, with a a gale force wind that blew so hard, Scripture says it was breaking the rocks of Mount Sinai, some kind of wind. 
And as the prophet began to walk outside and look at the wind uh, blowing past the mouth of the cave, he must have thought, I mean, this has got to be God. But it, but it wasn't him speaking. Then God sent an earthquake. I don't know, have you been in an earthquake before? How many have actually experienced? Yeah, aren't they fun? There's two kinds, aren't there? There's the rolling kind. They're kind of cool. Then there's the jerking kind. When I was in high school, I was playing football with my next door neighbor, and I went out for a banana pattern, you know. All I had to do was go, turn left, and catch the football. And I ran, did my little pattern, turned around to catch the football, and I was airborne, but I hadn't jumped. Bad sign. Uh, (laughs) California. It's an earthquake. Was God in the earthquake? Well, he sent the earthquake, but no, he wasn't speaking in that earthquake. And so then God sent a massive fire burning outside the mouth of the cave. I mean, out of nowhere, there's flames. God wasn't in that. And Elijah's standing there at the mouth of the cave going, what in the world? And then he heard the wind blowing. Well, a little breeze kind of whipped around the cave. And it sounded like a whisper. And then he heard, well, it's not the wind, it's a voice. Here's what he heard. It's the voice of God. In that wind, God said to him, asked him a question. What are you doing here? Has God ever come to you when you're in a cave like that after a moment of great spiritual victory and then something happens and you turn tail and run and you wind up in a cave, as it were, of self-pity when you should have hope to go forward with God? God's going to come to you in the same way. The little voice is going to be asking you, what in the world are you doing here? He comes and talks to him. And it's the love of the Lord, the shepherd who pursues him. And you read the story, and it's, not, it's just a lead into my sermon. I'll get to the sermon in a minute. But he comes to him and tells him, I'm not done with you. It's not over for you. You should have hope because I have great things in store for you as you go back up there and deal with Jezebel. Don't run from her. You know, I think in our day and age, a lot of Christians run from Jezebel. They turn tail and run, and they don't speak, and they don't say what needs to be said, and they hide in a cave, and they're ashamed, and they don't have hope, and God comes to you, and what's he whispering in the cave? Why are you in here? You have such great hope. See, Paul was an Old Testament scholar, a rabbi of the first order. If anybody would have known the story of Elijah, it would have been Paul. Uh, And if anybody could identify with Elijah, it's going to be Paul. I mean, imagine all the things that happened to him. Beaten, left for dead, stoned, shipwrecked, all the things that happened to him. Boy, he he could throw himself into a cave many times. But Paul had great hope. Uh, And he tells you in this chapter of Romans, chapter 8, in a a very exquisite way, why you as a believer should be hopeful as you fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. See, because that's what Elijah was doing, fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil. And he wound up in a cave of self-pity. And God tells him, you need to come out of here. And Paul said, I I can relate. I've been in that cave before, but I understand why I shouldn't stay there. So he's going to give you reasons why you should have hope in a dark day as you fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. We want to review his first reason why you should have hope to come out of the cave. Reason number one, verse 18, trials, like Jezebel-type trials, they lead to triumph because God's sovereign. Notice what he says. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He says, think about it. When you as a believer know what's coming I mean, when God appears, when Christ appears, and you appear in his presence, and you will see his glory, that makes everything down here on the planet seem totally insignificant. Think of what lies ahead. This is why in his writings, like in Colossians, he closes Colossians by uh, telling Christians, keep your mind set on Christ, on the heavenly things. When you fight the world, the flesh, the devil, the devil wants to disillusion you with trials and afflictions, and Paul says, don't worry, keep your mind set on the glory that uh, is ahead. And you know, will it not be enough for you? It will be enough for me to see the glory of Christ. I mean, to stand in his presence where there is no time for a thousand years. If I'm doing that, if I'm just standing there, do not come bother me. He looks like Pastor Marty. Just let me, be, let me enjoy the moment, you know, because to see the glory will make all the things on the earth pale and insignificance, Paul says. That's why you should have hope. Reason number two why you should come out of the cave and have great hope that God needs to use you to do great things in a dark day. Uh, He's going to say in verses 19 to 22 that cosmic degradation leads to cosmic transformation. Verse verse 19. It says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him, God, who subjected it. But this subjection to decay was all, he says, in hope. It wasn't hopeless. 
that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, what does the creation do if it could speak? Groans, groans, and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So he personifies nature here. It's a, it's a figure of speech. He takes nature and he says, let's personify it. If, if your lawn could speak to you, what would it say? I'm just saying. Former landscaper means a lot to me. But if your trees could speak, if the forest could speak, if the rivers, if everything, if you personified nature, what would you be hearing? Paul said you would be hearing a groaning noise because of decay and destruction. But he personifies it here and it says that, he says creation is anxiously longing for the revelation of the sons of God, i.e. Christians. Uh, When you take a Greek preposition and you wed it to a word, you intensify the meaning. So he takes the Greek preposition apo, and he weds it to karadokia, and that's the word for anxiously longing. So it's not like, I'm kind of excited about what's going to happen, but you're on your tiptoes trying to see it. It's so exciting. He says, it's, that's the picture of the cosmos. It's on its tiptoes waiting for one thing to happen. What's he waiting? What are they waiting for? The revelation of the sons of God, i.e. Christians. We'll talk about when that happens in just a minute. But they're waiting for that public revelation. See, right now, what, is, what do the non-Christians see? They see you as a, as, a, as a person in a body, a physical body. But they do not realize that you are a child of God, a son or a daughter of God, and that at the moment that you appear in his presence, you will reflect Christ. Remember Moses when he went up to the mountain, got the law, came back down? What was up with him? I mean, he had to put something over his face because you couldn't even look at him because he was glowing. Remember those little things they had back in the 60s, a little glow-in-the-dark thing, stick them near a lamp, and, you know, I had a little cross, and you'd stick it next to the lamp, and it would glow, and that's you, but in a more profound way, because you're going to be reflecting the glory of God. And Paul says the, the creation's waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, because now they just see you, eh, you're nothing unusual, but on that day, they'll see that you reflect God himself. They, the creation eagerly awaits, but in the meantime, the, the creation was subjected to decay. I don't know how you feel about science. You excited about it? Grammar and science. How do you feel about grammar? All right, I've converted a few. How do you feel about science? I love it. How do you feel about entropy? You love it? I don't. What what is that all about? The second law of thermodynamics. What, What is that all about, that entropy? What is it about? Everything's heading toward greater complexity and order. No, I just passed. I flunked that test, right? Yeah, everything's heading toward decay, decay destruction, etc. You know, it's like I took all those classes, zoology, biology, physics, took it all, high school, grad school. I mean, been there, done that. I never, I couldn't really wrap my mind around the evolutionary viewpoint for a couple of reasons. One of them is entropy. Everything's heading toward decay, destruction and decay, disorder, chaos. And you're telling me that everything's heading to greater complexity? It's not what I see. I mean, there's a problem. That's a huge problem. I mean, to me, one of the greatest arguments against evolution is just your living room, if you have children. (laughs) My daughter, when we FaceTime her, uh, which is like, I don't know, a couple times a day, she's got uh, twin granddaughters that are five and a little boy that's almost two. And my my daughter's, you know, very fastidious about keeping things clean. But, you know, a lot of times when we're FaceTiming, I'll I'll look behind her at the, the, the family room and I'll tell her, looks like you've been burglarized. She's like, Dad, I just put everything away. They just drug it all out. This is what law? Entropy. It just, it just heads that way. It's not her. Your house is probably heading to disorder as you sit here. <laughs> See, the, the creation's groaning because it's prone to decay. So you buy a new car. It's got no chips, no dings, no dents. Just drive it to Costco one time. <laughs> Park close. Yeah, this, the joke on the staff is because I hate door dings and stuff. If you go to lunch with me, prepare to burn off all the calories of lunch. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if I'm going to eat at Chick-fil-A, you know where Chick-fil-A is? I'm parked over like in the Safeway lot walking. That's me. You can always find my car. But it's like you buy that new car, what's going to happen to it? Try as you may. Something's going to happen to it because of the laws of decay. They're built into the cosmos. Uh, you put new siding on your house, it's going to get mold on it. It's going to grow on it, right? It just comes with the, it just comes with the, the vinyl. 
Uh, you, you have a new driveway. Mine has cracks going all through it, uh, and uh, I keep squirting liquid cement in there to keep it from expanding and being destroyed so I don't have to pay 10000 to put in a new driveway. Am I going to win? No, no. Science is, you know, laws of science are going to kick in. And when I pay the 10000 to put in a new driveway, what's going to happen in about 10 to 15 years? Same issue. So don't do it. <laughs> No, it's just law of entropy. And ladies, let's, let's tap into your world. You buy a coach purse. You like it? Yeah. yeah, you bought it. You bought it. Got a deal on it. You went to the outlet mall. Yeah, I've been in there. You buy it. And you buy that special leather that goes with it. It says coach, you know, leather you know, conditioning. And you, every time you use the purse, you put that on there. This thing's going to last forever. No, it isn't. No, it's not. What's going to happen? It's going to disintegrate. So don't buy it. I'm just saying. I'm trying to help you, man. You owe me big time. Law of entropy. Well, where did that law come from that everything breaks down and hits the decay and, dis, decay and disorder? Where'd that come from? It came from the fall. See, when the creation fell, it didn't fall because of anything it did. It fell because men fell. So that's why it says that it was subjugated. It was subjected to, to decay. Now, let's go back to Genesis 3 just to refresh your memory as to what happened. Uh, and it says in Genesis 3, verse 17, And unto Adam he, God said, after he sinned, Thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat. You tested my boundaries. Now what happens? Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I hate this part as a former gardener. Thorns and thistles. That's weeds, folks. We shall bring forth to thee, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. I mean, where did weeds come from? The fall. It's the devil. I mean, <laughs> it's part of the curse. Purslane, milkweeds, goat head, spotted spurge. Go pick one. Was that part of paradise? No, there were no weeds there. There were no weeds there. See, Jesus said, thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth. No kidding. If you don't take care of your yard with the right kind of chemicals, what happens? They take over by default. Some of your neighbor's yards have been taken over. If th nothing's done, their issues are going to become your issues. I mean, it's just part of the whole package that God judged the cosmos, and now we all have to pay the price down to decay. Were there thorns on rose bushes in paradise? No. Think about it. Think about it. Have you, ever, have you ever picked an artichoke off of an artichoke plant? Have, have you ever seen an artichoke plant other than Safeway? No one? Okay. One of my friends is a farmer in California, and, and we went out back of his house, and he showed me a couple years ago that one of the artichoke plants that he had in his backyard. It looks something out of a sci-fi movie, this massive thing with these big leaves and arms and spines coming off of it. My first point was, Where's the artichoke? He goes, well, it's kind of like it's in there among all those little stickers and spines. And my next question was, who was the first guy to eat that? <laughs> it didn't have that in paradise. Did mosquitoes bite people in paradise? No, no, no. Were, was there mildew in paradise? No, tree borers, brown spot, pythium blight? No, summer patch on your yard? No, no. How about avalanches, earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes? No, didn't have any of that. Drought, forest fires, mudslides, etc. Where'd that all come from? Fall of man. See, the creation was paradise. It wasn't built for that stuff. So why is the creation growing, groaning? Because it cannot do what it wants to do for mankind. But we say, well, we'll just come up with a new green deal and fix everything. <laughs> yeah, right. Is the creation waiting for the next green deal? that we're all okay then. No, what are they, what's the creation waiting for? Revelation of the sons of God. That's the sons of God, their appearance. And God said, I have built into the cosmos hope that one day it will be freed from this cycle of decay. So if the creation could speak, it would be saying, we groan at what we see as trees, plants, etc. but we are so excited that we have hope in paradise is coming back. See, decay, decay and destruction is not part of the character of God. When will this revelation and change happen to the cosmos? Well, I think it happens in two steps. Uh, step number one, at the end of the tribulation of seven years, when Jesus appears in glory, Matthew 24, is when he begins to push the, push the curse back. And I know he does because it's written all through the prophets in the Old Testament. Like, he's going to do several things when he comes to set up his kingdom. 
animals will be nice. You can call your cat and it comes to you. Yeah. That's why I don't have a cat. They never come to me. Uh, and my dog, whenever I hug my wife, Liz, what does he do? And I was like, what is his problem? Uh, you go to the zoo. You don't need cages. Why? They're not going to eat you. Right? Right? Uh, the lion will lay down with the lamb and vice versa, etc. Uh, the fear of mankind, according to Isaiah uh, chapter 11, chapter 35, chapter 65, the animals, they'll be at peace because that was all part of the curse. Flowers will be all over the desert blooming. Things will be so much more beautiful. Uh, prolific plant growth, according to the prophets in the Old Testament. I love Isaiah chapter 9, verses 13 to 14, because it talks about in the kingdom when Christ appears to set up his kingdom as prophesied in the Old Testament, when he sets it up, the, 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 the solar light is so much better in the kingdom age, you can throw seed out like wheat seed, and they're harvesting behind you. Do you ever buy those seed packages at Walmart? This year, we're saving money. We're planting seeds instead of buying all those flowers. How's that working for you? Do you <laughs> I've done this. I'm sharing you my pain. This is a confession. And <laughs> you, you ever read the label on the back? Because you read the fine print, it's going to say, you know, 60 days to germination, 30 days to germination, or never, because it's you, you know? I mean, <laughs> how come they never come up, you know? But in the kingdom age, you just open those, throw out the zinnia seeds, poof. See, when does that happen? When Jesus returns. When the creation can do for man what it was designed to do. And then at the end of the kingdom, a thousand years later, because we know it's a thousand years, because that kingdom age that's prophesied throughout the Old Testament in the Abrahamic covenant, in the Palestinian covenant, land parameters for Israel, uh, in the Davidic covenant, a king will reign over uh, the world uh, perpetually, Jesus. Uh, the new covenant, God will save Israel and give them a new heart and redeem the, the world. I mean, all those things will be finalized when Christ comes back. And Revelation 20 says it's going to last a thousand years, and the devil's going to be chained for a thousand years to see how does man do when Jesus is here? Does he, does he follow God? Then the devil's released at the end of a thousand years, and what's he do? Tempts the children that are born to people during that period. And then God sends fire from heaven and consumes, consumes them and casts the devil in the bottomless pit forever and ever. But during that kingdom age, well, during that kingdom age, when it ends, is when God recreates a whole new cosmos. How do I know that? I've read Revelation. Revelation chapter 21, what does John say? He says, then I saw at that time, after the end of the kingdom, Revelation 19, when Jesus returned, at the end of the kingdom age, Re Revelation 20, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Well, for the first heaven and the first earth, they passed away. And there was no longer any sea. He removed all the oceans from the planet. Could you imagine how much space there would be on the planet if there was no Pacific Ocean? Wow. I mean, have you not considered? Because in the kingdom, there won't be any oceans. And if you're a surfer, I apologize. Um, <laughs> He says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So what happens when Jesus returns uh, in, you know, at the second coming? Well, he sets up his kingdom, his Davidic kingdom, as prophesied for a thousand years, and removes the curse, pushes it back. But at the end of the kingdom, when the kingdom merges with eternity, he creates a whole new cosmos. He burns out the evil and destruction that was here and gives us something brand new, a new earth. And heaven, Jerusalem, comes down from heaven, its dimension, and hovers, as scholars believe, above the earth. And you're thinking, what are you going to be doing in heaven? Well, going in and out of the gates, enjoying all that this paradise is, and there's no sin. And you're worried about the world around you? God says, no, you, sh you should be looking ahead to the great transformation which comes. Second Peter chapter 3, Peter puts it this way. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and all the works that are therein shall be burned up. This is like a supernova. At the end of the kingdom period, God nukes the cosmos and says, I'm going to build a new one for my saints. I'm a, I don't know. Do I look excited? I mean, I keep looking forward as to what lies ahead, because I know that great transformation's coming. Degradation's now, but it's not the end of the story. So I have hope. You have hope. Reason number three, to have hope, personal consternation, and there's a ton of, there's a ton of that in life, leads to personal transformation. Verse 23, Paul says, and not only this, this amazing transformation of the cosmos, but we ourselves as Christians having the first fruits of the Spirit, 
even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. He says, who hopes for what he has already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we persevere, we eagerly then wait for it. You have, he says, according to the scripture, the first fruits of the Spirit. In the Old Testament, you can read about it in the book of Leviticus, the Feast of First Fruits, when the farmer threw his seed out for his, his crop for that year, the first uh, that germinated was the best of his crop. He then cordoned that off. That he gave to God first. That's his first fruits. He gave it to the, the priest in the temple. But the promise of the Feast of the First Fruits was there's more to come. You're not giving God all your field. You're giving him the best of your field. When you got saved, not only did Jesus forgive you of your sin and make you his child, his new creation, he gave you his Holy Spirit, uh, the, the, the first fruits of the Spirit. We could say he gave you a taste of what is to come by putting the Spirit of God in your life. I mean, to me, one of the most frustrating things is what I sense of the Spirit of God in my life that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt he is with me, you can't con- You cannot communicate that to a person who doesn't know God in a way they understand that because it's mystical and profound. But he says, you have that taste. I do. I have that taste of what what lies ahead. Well, what lies ahead? Paul says, well, let's contemplate that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, think about what will it be like when we are transformed. He says, for I know that our earthly house, your body of this tabernacle, that if they were resolve, dissolved, he says, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands. It's eternal in the heavens. For in this body, he says, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. He says, I, I'm desiring to get my new resurrected body. If it be so that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we know that this, in this tabernacle, we do groan, being burdened uh, by the body that you have. Not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. We as Christians are all living for the day that we have that eternal resurrected body. Now he that hath wrought in us the selfsame thing is God, who has also given to us the earnest of the Spirit. Same thing he said over in Romans. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. But if I'm absent from the, the body, where am I? With Christ. With Christ. And what do you get there? Well, you get a body that's as vastly different as a massive tabernacle is from an old dilapidated tent. He says, in in this body, we do groan, do we not? I mean, think about it. Are you who you used to be 20, 25 years ago? Because the body changes. That massive chest that you had in high school, college from weightlifting, has now moved. (laughs) I used to kid my dad all the time. And it's like, he's, it's like, he was like, my, my waistline used to be my chest. And I'm like, you used to have a 50-inch chest in high school? I don't think so. I've seen your pictures. You were a little stick of a man. But everything, everything changes and moves south, does it not? Yeah, it does. I was lifting weights last night thinking, this hurts. But I got to do it because if I don't do it, it gets really bad. You know, you're going to trade the old body for the new body. What an awesome thing. But he says, well, you're caught in this body. You, you do groan. Arthritis, et cetera. They did surgery on my finger a couple months ago. They, they took a, a, like a pair of pliers after they cut the thumb open. And, and, and <laughs> I was watching the whole thing. I, and surgery, cutting off part of my knuckle. Because they said I had arthritis. I'm like, I do? I'm so young. I mean, how did that happen? <laughs> it happens. It happens. You groan in this body, but we await that which comes. Well, what's coming? Paul says, contemplate what's coming. It's going to be vastly different. It's going to be like a tabernacle as opposed to a tent. Now, I love 1 Corinthians 15, what Paul says here about the body that's coming. He says, that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bare grain. It may be a chance of wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as it has pleased him and, and to every seed his own body. All flesh, Paul says, if you think about it, is not the same flesh. And then he tells you in case you need some illustrations. Uh, there's one kind of flesh of men. We'd agree. Is a different one for beast, like your dog, right? Its flesh is not your flesh. There's another for fish in the fish tank. Uh, there's another for birds. 
Uh, there's also you know, flesh of celestial bodies, bodies that are terrestrial, but the glory of one is of the celestial is one, the glory of a terrestrial is another. So Paul's saying, you know, if you just think about life and the body that is coming that God will give you at the moment of the resurrection, that body is going to be vastly different than the one that you have now. And he, and he says, if you think about the flesh around you, all the flesh that you see from, a, from an animal to a fish to a bird is merely telling you, if you're logically thinking, if there's different kinds of flesh here, what must there be in God's dimension? And then he says, if you consider the celestial bodies of your, above your head, um, I mean, think about him. He says, you know, there are different degrees of luminosity. Verse 41, there's one glory of the sun. There's another glory of the moon because it reflects the sun. Uh, there's a glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. Then he says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It is raised in power. He says, if you look above your head and you like astronomy and, and, and pick a constellation and look at all the stars in it and identify them, realize that different luminosity is merely an illustration. If you're logically thinking, the different degrees of luminosity tell me when I'm in God's presence, we will all be glowing with different degrees of luminosity, depending on where we are in relationship to Christ. You're going to be glowing in his presence. That twinkle of the greatness of God. That was Moses coming down from the mount. And then he says, your body is sown in weakness. Is it not? Is it not? But it is raised in power. Now, I have a friend here today who I grew up with who surprised me by coming here today. And I can embarrass him because we've known each other all of our lives. Uh, Mike Maddox is his name, and his lovely wife, Vinny. So if you don't mind, I'll embarrass you one time in your entire lifetime, okay? Is it okay? We're still friends? So why don't you stand, you and Vinny. Vinny, please. This is Mike. That's yeah, good to see you. You can sit down. Yeah. Now, I haven't seen Mike in 43 years. And we grew up together. I mean, prayed together, witnessed together, worked at Denny's together. I mean... I was at his house. He's at my house. I mean, we know each other well. And I just met Vinny. I never met his wife. And he found my family through, what, Facebook or something like that? And so, my, so they told me I'm getting a special guest today, somebody from my childhood. I'm like, who? Well, we can't tell you. I'm like, great. So then he calls me on my cell phone. Hi. And I'm like, I don't recognize the voice. And then he gives me a little scenario. And I'm like, you have two little boys who do not want to tempt God, but they want to grow in their faith what would you counsel them to do? And I told my mom, that's Mike Maddox. Because I said, we both sat in his front yard in high school, in the desert, looking up at the sky about one in the morning. And what did we pray, Mike? We said, God, if you want to use us in a great way, let a, star, let a star drop right there on the horizon for, for Mike. One fell. And then we said, let another, God, I mean my own. <laughs> <laughs> Did we not? So we turned direction and said, God, now in that quadrant of the sky, make one drop for me. One dropped. Kid you not. I still get chills thinking about that night. And then Mike's sitting here, he knows. I got in my car, a little B210, drove home, stick shift, wah, 1.30 in the morning, ran in the house. My parents are dead asleep, broke up in the door <laughs> of their bedroom. Hi, you cannot believe what happened. <laughs> I said, two stars, one for, Mark, one for Marty, one for Mike. In the quadrant of the sky, we pointed to him. God said, I can do that. Not by chance. God, if you want to use us greatly. He went into the Air Force. Of all things for God to use. The Air Force. Amazing, is it not? And we both thought we were going to go into ministry. Uh, but, we, but we did, didn't we not? Is not God good? But here's my question. Do we look the same that we did back in 1976? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't changed. I don't know. He's lying. Yeah. <laughs> we don't look the same. We don't look the same. But it's still us, is it not? But we do groan. But we look forward because we both know as men of faith what lies ahead, do we not? So we do groan. We grow because of evil. It, it seems to be running amok unchecked. We, we grow because of we, we slip and we fall so easily and we can't please God like we want to. But we shouldn't be hiding in a cave somewhere thinking God's done with us because he's not ever done. Not ever done. So what's he doing to you if you're in the cave? Well, he's, he's coming to you this morning and he's whispering to you in the wind. What's he whispering to you? 
For I consider that the current sufferings of the present time of your life cannot even be compared to what's coming. I'm not done. I'm not done. Do you believe it? I believe it. And because I believe it, I don't want to stay in the cave. There's no hope in there. Paul says, hey, come out of the cave. Do great things for God. Great things for God. And don't be afraid to ask great things for God. He'll bless you. Let's pray. Well, God, thank you for being a great God. Uh, you put hope in the sale of, sales of your saints. Uh, you answer the, the prayers of two kids. You are amazing. May we come out of the cave today, if we've been in there with self-pity, and say, God, use us in a profound, magnificent fashion to cut deep into the devil's kingdom and to do it with grace and do it with power and do it in the spirit of Elijah. Help us to come out and have great hope that you are not done with us yet. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.